So let's bring in our uh, distinguished experts, see where we go from here. We got David Bonson, the Bonson Group CIO. He's a founder, managing partner, author of the DividendCafe.com, and he's got a new book out, Full Time, Work and the Meaning of Life. Let's see, it's out February 6th. I think that's Tuesday. So I'm sure you can dial up your favorite bookstore and get it. And we have Kenny Polcari, Managing Partner at Case Capital Advisors and Chief Market Strategist at Slate Stone Wealth. All right, kids, uh, welcome. David Bonson, give me 30, 40 seconds on the new book, The Value of Work. Work is godly. That's what I think. You know, one of my early inspirations on this message was a guest on Bill Buckley's firing line many years ago by the name of Larry Kudlow, (laughs) who talked about the dignity of work. And I don't know if you remember that episode, Larry, but it was inspiring. And the message, of course, is an eternal one. God made us from the Garden of Eden to work. He made us to be productive. It's the whole story of supply-side economics to drive production, to remove impediments from production. But it's also the story of the soul of society. We're a happier people when we're working, and I am just absolutely tired of this anti-work message that's permeated our churches, our culture, and our politics. Yeah, you know, that's – Ken Paul Carey, I'm pretty sure you're going to agree with all this as well, you know, because – I mean, it's true what David just said. The the message coming from so many areas of life today is don't work. You know, you should be free. Government should give you money and you should be free to pursue your talents and go and paint pictures and walk by the by the ocean and all this stuff. Work is everything. Work is everything. Work is everything. I hear you, David. I can't wait to read this book. I got to reach out and get it. But the other thing is there's a whole generation. You know, this generation that's like between 20 and, say, 30, they don't – they want to work when they want to work. They don't want to work on Friday. They don't want to work on Monday because Monday you have to, you know, after the weekend, you have to just kind of sit around and do nothing. And then they only want to work for, you know, five or six hours during the middle of the week. And then they want Fridays off because that's just what they want. It's amazing to me where they get – or where they don't get the work ethic that we all have and grew up with and that our parents instilled in us. But, you know, Tenny, let me say something about that, because I agree 100 percent. And that Gen Z attitude, which is probably not even as bad as the Gen Y attitude. But I think where where they got it was in the boomers who worked really hard and worked their whole lives, but stated that the purpose of work was to not have to do it anymore, to work to the point of getting to a 30 year vacation. Well, I'm not going to share on air here Larry's age, but Larry's doing five days a week at Fox Business, one day a week on WABC after a second stint in the White House. And, you know, Larry's no spring chicken. (laughs) (laughs) I'm a a fried, I'm more of a fried chicken. I don't know about a spring chicken. (laughs) But that's that's why it's so frustrating for me, because, look, I understand you want to work and then ultimately you do want to retire at some point, but between the between say twenty five and sixty five, it's about working and building and creating and and getting to that point. How are you going to do that when you're thirty five? If you want to work, you know, three days a week and only want to work four hours a day, it's ridiculous. Yeah, I don't. Yeah. E- I don't even remember sixty five. I'm still kicking. <laughs> I'm still going. It's all right. Uh, David Bonson, um, give us a word of wisdom on the stock market. Well, there's two things. The really good side is that earnings are positive. Uh, It's, you know, a recession is when earnings go negative. It's when jobs go negative. It's when wages go negative. So corporate profits are rising um, and stocks are doing well. And by the way, they're doing better democratically. You know, you had some of the Magnificent Seven names get hit pretty good this week. Google in particular got slammed. Facebook had the biggest up day in market history, but Apple was down, Microsoft was down. So some of the big leaders of 2023 are not doing well, but my beloved consumer staples are doing well. A lot of the the more value names, dividend growth names are doing well. So that's a good thing. What's the bad thing? Yeah, it's just valuations are still very high. Mm. That dependency on NVIDIA, the dependency on Meta, 
that's not good. The market is going to have to see more breadth. But ultimately, uh, the Bears have gotten their faces ripped off. That's what's happened. And so I think you're now in a position where you you probably don't want to just be relying on Magnificent Seven. There are some uh, good opportunities out in the market. But the real compelling arguments to be negative are not on the table. Yeah, I would agree with that. Um, so, Kenny, um, I'm just looking. Bond rates fell quite a bit. Tenure was off 12 basis points. This past week, 402. Yeah. Um, 30 year was off 15 basis points. The short rates are flat. But the jobs report suggests there's not going to be any Fed rate cutting for quite a while, if at all. But the, bo- <laughs> but the bond market took it well and the stock market took it well, which is interesting yeah, to me. So you and I have been in that camp that it was illogical to begin with to think that rates were going to come down considering the, the, how strong the economy was, what the economic data was, was, was revealing. And Friday's report just continues, to your point, to David's point, just continues to tell that same story. So I don't know how anybody can now imagine that March is still on the table or that May is on the table and maybe not even June. And at at that point, what happens? Can the Fed really start to move rates in the summertime when we're within that six-month window of a presidential election? I'd like to think not because they shouldn't and they never did. But, you know, it's a new year, right? It's a new time. But. I think yes, the bond market did take it in stride. People were not uh, uh, were not running out of uh, out of equities at all. In fact, that's the the article that Bank of America had, which showed big U institutions last week selling selling record amounts of of, uh, of equities. Because I think they were all planning for this report to be negative, and the market was going to back off, and they were going to reallocate that cash. And that's not what happened at all. Well, but Kenny, when you say you can't imagine anyone thinking rates are going to come down in May. The futures market has a 100% chance. I, I, I mean, in Mar- March is still showing 38%. Now, I, I don't think they're going to end up cutting in March. But the reason why they're going to cut in May is because yeah. it isn't true. It isn't true that jobs create inflation. It isn't true that economic growth is a negative thing. And what we're okay. getting right now is non-inflationary growth. That's the kind of th- thing the three of us are supposed to be happy about. We don't need a rate above the natural rate. No, no, but we still have the CPI at 3.8%. It's not anywhere. But, it is at a three, but the CPI is not at 3.8. The CPI is not at 3.8. It's annualized right now at 2.6 yeah. over the last six months with a totally, as I, I'll just say BS, shelter number. There, the CPI is assuming 7% inflation in rent yeah. when the market indicators are 0% soaking wet. And so I think the inflation rate has a two-handle now, and you have 0% goods inflation and outright deflation in in a handful of other goods and services. You know, David, um, you should send Jay Powell a copy of your new book. You know why? Because (laughs) the prevailing models at the Fed suggest that work is bad. Think about that. The Phillips curve upon which consensus – Left of center economics is based today, a trade-off between unemployment and inflation suggests that low unemployment, a.k.a. more people working, is a bad thing. So you need to send him a copy of your book to straighten out his thinking. Well, and what's interesting is I attended his lunch in New York in October, and he said – the Phillips curve model doesn't seem to be working anymore. And I was trying to figure out what kind of model works sometimes and doesn't work other times. And and we would still call it a mathematical model. You know, math works all the time. And you're, you're right. But see, you've been right for 40 years on this. The Phillips curve was broken back when they were first heralding it, when you did get high unemployment and high inflation in the 1970s. And, and so these coincident periods where sometimes there was this relationship held up between inflation and, and employment is just silly to believe it was causative. And yet you and I know why. Kenny knows why, right? We want people working because it produces more goods and services. And the production Correct. of goods and services is anti-inflationary. It's pro-growth. Tell that to the 5,000 economists at the Fed, 90 percent of whom, by the way, are registered Democrats. Just yeah. saying, yeah. just saying, just yeah. throwing a little something in there. Uh, it sounds like to me, though, uh, Kenny, that this will be a profits driven market now. Let's, I think it will be. 
Yeah. It's going to be a profit-driven market, and it's going to be an AI-driven market. Let's call it what it is. AI is very much in its infancy stages, and there's a lot there's a lot to look forward to, and I think that's going to be the driver as well. Is you know on that point, uh, Kevin Hassett talks a lot about that. Ed Yardeni talks a lot about that. Uh, yeah. Yardeni, one of the few people that actually got the story right last year, the so-called soft landing story. But um, uh, productivity came out this past week, and um, non-farm productivity, four quarters, 2.7%. Big number, a very good number, um, which led me to suggest that the increase in pay and wages in the recent job reports, including the report yesterday, People are earning their increases in pay because productivity output per hour is going up. 2.7% is an awfully good number. That's much better than the five or 10 year average. I don't know if it's sustainable, but my question to both of you is does AI and the application of all the quantum computing kinds of uh, breakthroughs, will that uh, keep productivity growing at a rapid pace? Because if it is, then you'd expect lower inflation, stronger growth, and higher profits, and that's fabulous for stocks. What do you guys think? Right, but I think that is what, the, to David's point, is your point, I think that's what the market's telling you. It's trying to look past what it thinks is, you know, by the broken mathematical models, and it's now focusing on uh, what the future is going to look like. And I am in that camp that I do think, while there'll be lots of adjustments with AI, and some people are going to get, some people are going to lose, and some people are going to win, but in the end, I think it's going to end up creating new and different jobs, and that's what's going to drive it. David, what do you think about this thesis? Yeah, you know, I listened to Kevin on your show this week, and I totally agree that there's going to be various catalysts that drive productivity. And he made an analogy on your show to the Internet. And what I was thinking was how true it was mm. that so much of digital computing added to productivity, but 95% of those NASDAQ companies still went away. All the Super Bowl commercial ads from 1999 still went bankrupt. <laughs> I still worry about the uh, what we're going to see in terms of dead bodies out of AI when all is said and done, which companies are just a fraud that aren't going to make it, that are hyped up. And then there will end up being a few survivors. You know, people talk about the Internet as a big success because it's such a transformative thing in our lives. You look at the just thousands of percent return that Amazon and Google generated, and we forget about Pets.com and all those laughable Mm. companies from the late 90s. So I still think people want to be wary of jumping into the fad of AI investing and yet still recognize what Kevin's Kenny's talking about, that there is a productivity boom out there. And it isn't all just AI. It is really CapEx, too. And this, to me, is a thing we're not talking enough about, that there is a lot of capital expenditures that we haven't seen coming back. I think a lot of the repatriation of foreign profits from the Trump tax cuts, I think the reduced corporate income tax rates, Mm. I think this instant expensing they're going to get back if this bill gets done Mm -hmm. on uh, CapEx. Mm. I think the the, uh, debt deduction, the interest deduction for corporate spending. I think the R&D deduction, these things are supply side. Right? Yeah, I know. They're good. You know, Republicans have forgotten about tax cuts. I mean, I'm glad uh, uh, Jason Smith is not the head of the Ways and Means Committee, but the Wall yeah. Street Journal editorial page has just forgotten about their supply side roots. But I'm with you. I think it's a good bill. I know the child credit bill is not popular among conservatives, but it's not the worst thing in the world either. We had it in the Trump tax cuts. Not the worst thing in the world. There is a work requirement in there. Anyway, kids, let's uh, take a quick break. Dave Bonson of the Bonson Group, DividendCafe.com, and his new book, important book, full-time, Work and the Meaning of Life. Uh, we're going to send it to everybody in Washington. And Kenny Polcari, Case Capital Advisors, and Slate Stone Wealth. I'm Kudlow. We'll be right back. 